Okay, so now we get into second part, right? And this is the part we've been waiting for, right? This whole part about um, connecting to God through the other. We knew already a little bit from Levinas, right? So nothing was too new about that. But now we're going to be talking about this notion of frequency and attunement, right? Let me write down these words I'm going to be using. Attunement, right? Uh, uh, right, the frequency, the God frequency, right, this is, would make a great book title, <laughs> right, so we're, we're talking about something like that, right, how do we uh, acquire this connection with God, right, that most of us actually, it, it's true, most of us are not born with this, right, some of us, it's, there's, it's true that some of us have it naturally, right, just like people are gifted in music or gifted in gymnastics, some people are gifted spiritually and they have a natural connection with God since their childhood. And it's pure and simple and it makes total sense <laughs> to them, right? And it's authentic. When you talk to them, you do sense they have a connection, right? With love, with, with peace, with joy, with something higher, right? They are living on a higher level than most people. They're living on a higher frequency. So, and they're doing it naturally. For them, it's normal, right? But most of us, we don't have that, right? We struggle with this. We, we struggle with um, depression, anxiety, and unbelief, doubt, frustration, right? Like, like Job, right? So, so it's, it's, it's not, for most of us, this is not a natural connection. And some of us even try to have the connection and we fail, right? I have countless essays that students have written where they say, you know, for a while I prayed, God, please reveal yourself. Let me feel, and nothing, right? You get no answer and then you give up, <laughs> right? So here, this is really important information, right? How do we come into attunement with, um, with God, right? What is it? Remember, that's for Simon Weil. We have to, in a way, reposition ourselves, right? If the reason we're not getting this, um, uh, connection is that we are on the wrong frequency, like the radio, right? So we have to, in a way, reposition ourselves, reattune ourselves, and then we can have a direct connection, right? Now, remember, uh, both Maimonides and Rumi talked about this, right? So she's going to give us a few more pointers how to do this. Now, the, the main concept, I'm going to first summarize and then we'll read it, right? The main concept she's going to use is the concept of attention, right? If you can understand attention, uh, and then eventually the passive activity that she'll talk about, uh, you will understand how to attune yourself again. So before we go into that, let me just um, give an illustration of how this works on the level of relationships, right? If we, it's the same dynamic, right? And relationships all have the same formula, <laughs> right? In other words, if you can understand how to relate to another human being, you can understand how to relate to God and vice versa. So let's imagine someone, or if you're in that position, you can imagine yourself, right? That you are really longing to be in a romantic relationship, right? Same idea, right? You're longing to be in a relationship with God, but that aside, let's imagine you're wanting to be in a romantic relationship um, and you start actively uh, lobbying for this. You do everything, right? You go to clubs, you go on like five dating sites and you're like, super proactive you go and you start losing weight in the gym right you start pumping you know big weights <laughs> we women lose weight and the men they want to add the weight right so we're doing everything we're working so hard are we gonna find love is that gonna work through this hard work we're putting in what do you think for those who've tried <laughs> does hard work bring romantic love that's the question Maybe you don't know. Let me turn you on. on. Yes. Uh, no. Why no, Rodriguez? Why do you say that all my hard work is for nothing? <laughs> okay, good, De La Torre. Let me hear Rodriguez, and then I'll comment on what you said, De La Torre. Go ahead, Rodriguez. Well, because if you're putting effort, it's, um, it's like almost you're going against the natural, right? If you just allow yourself, open yourself up and allow and invite, I'm gonna use new age language here, and invite and be open. Magnetize. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Set the intention, whatever it is. Um, then 
you will find that's that's how love usually comes right you love usually comes when you're not looking for it um and if you're putting in all this work it i've seen people do it it just never works out okay very good right absolutely few of you added to what rodriguez is saying uh de la torre you find it when you're not actively looking for it Simone, you can't force these things to happen. You guys already know a lot. This is wisdom beyond your years, <laughs> right? In other words, when it comes to relationship, you cannot make it happen. You can make your career happen, more or less. You can make, you know, do this assignment. You can, right? But when it comes to relationships, it's, it's a different approach we need to have. The active striving, the willing, the willful uh, effort, right? Remember these words, right? Active striving. She's going to talk about that. The willful effort, right? All of this, right? Doesn't work because love is not something you can capture. It's not something you can control, right? It comes to you when? When you let go, right? When you relinquish control, when you're just open, right? Now, it doesn't mean you're giving up and you're sitting on your couch all day eating potato chips, right? Watching, uh, what's this last thing about the tiger? You know, the Netflix, the horrible Netflix show with about these, these guys raising a tiger. What is this? Oh, tiger King? <laughs> yes, Tiger King, right? This is not the way, guys, <laughs> right? This, so th there's two, uh, two extremes, right? When it comes to romantic relationship, the first extreme is like, ah, I'm gonna make it happen. And you're like, ah, working out in the gym, looking at everybody, you know, staring, trying to, you know, trying to be like doing this, doing that, nothing works, right? Other extreme, giving up, slacking off, sitting on the couch, cynical about love, it doesn't exist, walking around dressed in black, you know. Um, so there's, there's a, those two approaches don't work. She, she's not talking about giving up when she says, giving in right relinquish control doesn't mean giving up relinquish control means rather i'm open i am ready i am open to receiving i'm open to this happening to me i know i can't control it but i know that i can watch for it right this openness and receptivity is what simon Vale calls attentiveness right to be attentive by the way, attentive, it's interesting, from the root, uh, French root, attendre, which means to wait, <laughs> interestingly, right? So attentive is a kind of openness, right? To be attentive means to be watchful, to be uh, focused, but the root of the word, right? Uh, I think uh, maybe in Spanish, what does attender mean in Spanish? Does it mean to wait? Anybody, where am I Spanish? <laughs> What is that then? Is there so, to pay attention? Okay, so it's the same, same thing as the French. Okay, good. Um, it's also the same root as the word attendre in French, which means to wait, not just to pay attention. So, um, so you have this notion of openness, a receptivity, waiting, right? Rather than making happen. Okay, if you've understood this on the romantic level, number one, you're very good. Uh, you're going to do well, <laughs> right? Number two, you have understood a very deep spiritual truth, right? Because what Simon Weil is saying is that is the same for God. You can't make it happen. You can't be sitting there and be like, okay, I want God to reveal himself to me and he needs to do it in this particular way. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna uh, be sitting there with expectations, right? And you're dictating the whole thing and you're controlling the whole thing. Remember the first step of purification of Maimonides. That's the one that you're now falling into, the trap, right? And she's saying, no, you have to actually, when, if you want to have a spiritual experience, you have to learn to be simply attentive, open, receptive, right? Now, let, now that we've understood the basics, let's go into the text and go into the details. Okay, let's go to page 126. <clears throat> okay, 126, third paragraph, the effort that brings a soul to salvation. Who is there? Put your hand out. Third paragraph, 126, okay. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna understand better what she's saying. The effort uh, that brings a soul to salvation. So she's saying this is still an effort, right? Waiting for love is an effort. It's harder than making it happen, right? Sitting there open, receptive, you know, attentive is difficult. Right, especially uh, in our civilization where we are pressured 
to get things done, right? To make things happen. It doesn't work that way. So the effort that brings a soul to salvation is like the effort of looking or of listening, right? You are listening. You are looking. You are attentive. You're watching for the signs. You're watching where life is leading you. What things open, right? Where are the invitations? And she says it is an act of attention and consent Whereas what language designates as will is something suggestive of muscular effort. Remember, we talked about willful, I'm going to make it happen. That's the will, right? The attitude that says, I'm going to make this happen. She's saying the will is not good. That's not how you do it, right? And she explains. The will is on the level of the natural part of the soul, which is not a good level. It's the level of the low part, <laughs> right? Uh, the right uh, use of the will is a condition of salvation, but it's remote, inferior subordinate negative right so she's comparing um the the spiritual uh journey to a garden right the weeds are pulled but only sun and water can make the corn grow right so if you want to really grow spiritually yeah 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 you have to pull a few weeds but it's not what's making you grow right to pull the weeds so that's the active right but the real growth is coming unbeknownst to you right it's the sun and the rain it's not in your control that is what is causing your growth likewise by the way um, when it comes to a relationship just to add and we all struggle with relationships so it's good to have a little bit of parentheses on that right you know how your relationship's going bad right not going well uh, one way to see it is like a garden where yes you have to actively pull out the roots uh, the weeds try to, you know, not be toxic, change your ways and so forth. But ultimately the healing, the growth of the relationship is a, is a grace, right? It's a gift. The actual restoration Okay, I had to go close to the modem <laughs> now hopefully i can finish my sentence okay this is gonna look great on the recording <laughs> okay we we're talking about um <laughs> like we um spiritual like the spiritual like a parallel of like a garden and the difficulties with relationships yeah exactly right you can weed a little bit but the actual restoration of the relationship, right, is not in your hands. And to understand that, to release, you know, to stop seeing, like we said in Marcel, the relationship like a problem, but like a mystery. To actually not try to fix the relationship, but allow the relationship to fix you, right? That's what's interesting here, right? Same thing spiritually, same rules of the game, right? You can weed, you can do a few things, you can try and read this, you know, you can try and go to this community, you can, you, you need to try, right? You need to do a few things, but you know that ultimately the encounter is not in your hands. It will come out of nowhere, right? It will surprise you. That's the idea. So actually when you're doing these things and exploring maybe different faiths or reading different scriptures or whatever, you're very relaxed, right? You're doing, so she says there is room for the will, right? She's saying, the will uh, is the condition of salvation. You have to want to begin the journey, right? You have to begin to take a few steps. That's the will. But you're taking the steps in a state of relaxation. You're not thinking that you're in control of the outcome. This leads me directly to the concept in the Tao Te Ching, uh, which she calls, where is it? Uh, passive activity, right? Let me say that again. So passive activity. So she's further going to describe this, right, as an act of passive activity. Now, um, maybe we can hear from Cholivas, who is the expert, right? What does it mean, passive activity, in the Tao teaching? Cholivas, go ahead. <laughs> Putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, I'll try. Okay, so passive activity, you are... Uh, I wrote it down before it was easier, so I don't know to explain it. Your, by being simple in your actions and in your thoughts, you return to the source of being. Yes. And you talk about...
explicitly in your paper, right? You say this, um, I'm quoting you here, right? Um, simpli where did you get this quote, by the way? I'm curious. Simplicity is free of all external aims. It's free of desire. Then I can't read my writing anymore. <laughs> At rest and still. And all things go as God, as of their will. Is that what you wrote? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Let me write this down for everybody. Where did you get this quote? I found it. It was one of the translations on the Tao Te Ching. Oh, very good. All right. I'm writing it down for everybody. This is very good. Simplicity is free from all external aims. There is no desire. Is that it? Uh, how, how did you put it exactly? I can, I can copy and paste it. It's your paper. Ah, very good. Please copy and paste me this quote so we can all write it. Okay, excellent. So let me comment while he's doing that, right? So the quote here that he, that he uh, took from the Tao Te Ching, simplicity or the simple action or passive activity, right, is free of all external aims. Okay, so this is really interesting, right? Basically, you are acting, but you are not in control of the outcome. It's the same in a relationship, right? Yes, there are a few steps you have to take, right? Yes, there's a few things you have to do. Uh, you know, go here, go there, explore this, yeah. visit this person, go on a date, whatever, right? But do it in a state of relaxation, right? Let me make sure everybody's muted. Um, yeah, right? So you're doing it in a state of complete relaxation because you know that you're not in charge of the outcome, right? So you're, so it's, it's acting, but without the, uh, right? That's what it means, passive activity. You're acting without pressure without stress, without thinking that the outcome is in your hands. You're acting in a way that you are, it's, it's you're acting in order to receive. That's it, that's passive activity. Let me say it again. It's an action that you do knowing that at the end of it, only grace can intervene. You're doing these, you're taking these steps in order to receive something uh, like love or a spiritual encounter and so forth. Um, so it's, so that's what uh, he wrote, right? Um, free from all external aim, no desire, at rest and still, right? You, you know you're acting in this way when you're peaceful, right? If you're acting and you're anxious and stressed and nervous, you're not, you're not doing it. You're just pure will. Passive activity is relaxed action. Is peaceful action because you know ultimately the outcome is not in my hands. All I need to do is my part, no matter how small it is, but I need to do the best I can, knowing that the outcome is not in my hands, right? We do our best and God does the rest, right? That's bumper sticker, <laughs> which is very helpful, right? Let, let, let me write it down, right? Uh, do your best and God will do the rest. This is a this is something, this is the, the, the motto you should have, right? This is, this is the attitude. You do your best knowing that ultimately the outcome is not in your hands. And finally, it says, um, and then all things go as of their will. In other words, this is so important. When you're acting in this way, what you're doing, because you're not in control, is creating a space for the other to come towards you, right? Let me say it again. When you're acting in this way without you know, trying to control the situation, what you're really doing is allowing for the other to come towards you. You're allowing for love to come to you. You're allowing for a divine encounter to come to you. If you're doing everything, there's no room for the other to approach you, right? So this kind of relaxed doing, passive activity, is, a, is creating an opening for the other to come in, right? Uh, whereas if you're always striving to make it happen, then there's no room in your life for another person, right? Um, so that was a great quote. Um, so let, any questions on that quote? Uh, here's another one. Whatever I do, I do my best, leave the rest to... Oh, is that in the Tao Te Ching? No. Oh, it was from a, a different source. Okay, what uh, is it? Uh, it was from a martial arts source. Can you find it? <laughs> that reminds me of um, Stoicism, particularly that quote talking about providence. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, I guess, an understanding of Stoicism that you should under, you should 
only be concerned about things that you are within your control. So you're not necessarily in control of the outcome, but you are in control in performing to the best of your ability. Yeah, absolutely, right? And, and stoicism, we know, is, is very influenced by Eastern thought, right? Uh, and even, they don't say it explicitly, right? But Epictetus especially seems to imply, so let me write this guy, he's a stoic philosopher, he seems to imply that when you fully embrace what has been given for you to do, that's when life moves you forward, right? So there is an element in stoicism of moving forward. You're not supposed to be stuck in a situation and just embrace the situation stoically, right? No. The moment you start to do the task that nature has given you to do, the small tasks that are within your reach, right? Then life itself, right, begins to push you forward, right? So same idea, right? Then you find this in many traditions, right? Um, uh, and, and it's, it's very profound truth, right? That when it comes to any type of relationship, whether it's romantic or with God, this ability to just, I'm gonna do what I can, knowing that ultimately the vision, the epiphany, the revelation will happen when it will happen, right? Okay, so let's read a couple more quotes where she elaborates on that. Um, okay, so we saw um, the, okay, Page 126, one, two, three, four, five, six paragraph. This is where she talks about passive activity, right? This kind of passive activity, the highest of all, she says, right, is perfectly described in the Bhagavad Gita and in Lao Tse, right? So this is an Eastern concept that the West really needs, I think, to remember or learn, right? And you find it in Hinduism and you find it in Chinese philosophy, right? And so forth. And then she continues, uh, last paragraph. Okay, no, let's go to the next one. 127, there are people. Everybody's there? There are people on 127? Okay. Right, there are people who try to raise their souls like a man continually taking standing jumps in the hopes that if he jumps higher every day, a time may come when he will no longer fall back but will go right up to the sky. Some of us love like this. Some of us pursue someone like this, right? We're like <laughs> pushing, pushing, right? And she says, thus occupied, he cannot look at the sky. We cannot take a single step toward heaven. Now, she, does, she doesn't mean by that that you just sit around and do nothing. She's simply saying all our steps are necessary so that God can take us up, right? So our steps are simply ways of saying, I'm ready. They're not going to do anything for you. They're simply showing that you're ready, right? That's what she says here. It is not in our power to travel in a vertical direction. If, however, we look heavenward for a long time, God comes and takes us up. Right, so the ability to just be attentive, take small steps without anxiety or pressure, right? Then one day the encounter will happen according to her, right? In God's time and in God's way, obviously, right? Uh, and then she continues, uh, he raises us easily. As Eschylus says, and this is another uh, very similar quote to the Tao Te Ching, there is no effort in what is divine, right? There was another quote from, that I got from Holivas's paper that I wrote, which is, the easy way is the right way, right? Let me type it up for you. The easy way is the right way. Thank you for doing my research for me, Holivas. <laughs> that, that's, from, that's from Bruce Lee. Okay, Bruce Lee, perfect. All right, so we have Bruce Lee quote. Olivas, for those who don't know, is a martial arts teacher, so he is well-versed in these things. <laughs> okay, so yes, right, the easy way is, wait, what did I write? The easy way is the right way. Same thing, right? If, if, it, if it's hard, it's not going to work, right? If you sense that something is laborious, it's not working, that's not the right way. By the way, for those of us who've studied math to a high degree, <laughs> right, you know when you're starting to resolve a problem and that it's getting complicated and complicated, you know you should just turn back, start in another direction. Because every math problem, the path is simple, right? Uh, you know this when you've done math, for real. Okay, there is an easiness in salvation which is more difficult to us than all our efforts. It's difficult because we are not in control. That's the most difficult thing for us, is to wait. We can't do that. We can't do it. How many of us wait with pleasure? Nobody, right? You start to wait, you, you start to go crazy, right? It's difficult to wait for us who want to, uh, right, make it happen. So 
Um, so this, by the way, they bring me to the last point, right? This notion of patience she's going to talk about, right? This is often the reason we don't have a connection with God is that we are not capable of waiting, right? Not even, right? Even if we're capable of passive activity, acting without goal or outcome, right? Thinking of the outcome, we can do that. But if we give up too soon, and that's the problem with a lot of us, right? From many papers that I've read over the years, I notice people give up too soon. It doesn't work right away. Something happens. Ah, there's nothing, right? And what she's saying here is fundamental, right, to this attunement is the ability to wait until something happens. And until something happens, you don't know, right? It's the ability to stay in the no man's land, in the agnostic state, always attentive, always open. That's what Marcel was talking about, right? How open are we? Are we able to receive, right? And she's saying now, in addition to receiving, are we able to not give up too soon, right? She says this on page um, 128, second paragraph. Are you there? The attitude that brings salvation. Put your hands. Yes? One hand? Okay, thank you. Okay, the attitude that brings about salvation is not like any form of activity. Okay, we saw that already. The Greek word which expresses it is uh, upomene and paciencia, which is the Latin, is rather an inadequate translation of it. Now here she explains. It is the waiting or attentive and faithful immobility that lasts indefinitely and cannot be shaken. This is the one. This is the word, indefinitely. Let me write it down. That's the key. Indefinitely. Definitely. Okay, Blades, can you say it for me with your American now? <laughs> indefinitely. Thank you. Indefinitely. <laughs> right? Now, what does indefinitely mean? Blades, go ahead. You can pronounce it. You can also define it, no? <laughs> definitely. I guess indefinitely is like um, something that is very much assured, like more assured than definitely. No, oh, not quite. <laughs> not quite. It's a temporal. Oh, wait. Temporal, okay. Yes, yeah, it's a temporal. Trujillo has it. Definitely. It has Trujillo because of the Spanish. <laughs> it has no, if you know Spanish or French, you know a lot of words in the English language. <laughs> in that indefinitely has no end. In other words, you are willing to wait until something happens. And as long as nothing happens, you're there. How many of us can do this, right? How many of us really want it to the point that we're gonna sit in the same spot indefinitely until something shows up. And if nothing shows up and we're in our deathbed, we can be calm and serene knowing we did our best, <laughs> right? That's what she's talking about. How many of us have the audacity to do that, right? Many of us are like, I wanna waste my time. What's a waste of time? You're just open. You're not wasting time. You're doing everything else too, <laughs> right? But along with doing everything else, you're attentive. Right? You're open. You're, you keep your eyes open, your ears open for the signs. And you follow the signs once they pop up. This is another meaning of the passive activity, is an action which is responding to the environment rather than actions stemming from your will. Let me add, right? This is another definition of passive activity. Um, I'm adding to what Holiva said, right? The action. So there's two ways of understanding passive activity, right? One is action without, uh, uh, um, it's a goal or without, you're not, not worried about the outcome, right? That's the first definition we talked about, but there's a second one, right? Passive activity is also an action which is responding to the environment rather than trying to control it, right? So in other words, uh, passive activity is an action which is you're acting because something urged you to act. Okay, let me say that again, let me write it down, right? You are acting not because you want to do it, but because something in the environment is urging you to act, right? is urging you to act. In other words, you are acting in response to your environment. So this, spiritually speaking, it would look like this. You're open, you're attentive, you get an invitation. You act. 
in the direction of that invitation. You don't know. Who knows? Might be the moment, right? Or someone gives you a book or someone gives you, you know, or, or you stumble or you have a random conversation, right? Whatever you, you, you are eager to follow the sign. That's the other meaning of passive activity. Your action is always a response. You're not initiating. You're waiting. And when something opens up, you're walking, right? So the ability to kind of explore is needed there. A certain kind of curiosity, right? Not being held back by convention, tradition, the fear of being ridiculous. You're kind of just exploring <laughs> right uh, you're just curious you're that's the other meaning of passive activity right you're open to whatever invitations the universe is giving you i.e god right okay um i think i said everything <laughs> um good yeah all right, um, any questions? <clears throat> no question. And I have a question. It is in the page 84. Uh, we're just talking about a pain. Can you, can you elaborate that one, please? 84? Yes. What, what part of 84? Um, is that 84? So what the book is talking about the pain. Um, I'm trying to locate the passage. About pain? No, pain. Uh, oh, veiled love, yes. Let's, let's leave that or well, actually, yeah, veiled love, this is the veiled form of love, right? So this is having to do with the implicit loves, right? you when you love the world it's a veiled love of god right when you love the neighbor it's also implicit that's what she means it's an implicit love a veiled love it's not yet the actual encounter there's a veil between you and god right it, the experience is mediated by something else nature the rituals human beings that's the veil does that make sense uh, yes thank you great any other comments or questions Okay, very good. All right, let me uh, stop the recording.